Oh, no my, hi to my. Welcome and welcome to the future of medicine. I'm starting with this slide and I'll, I'll use a lot of AI generated images today. This isn't one of them. This is Tidera, two tides uh, on the Coromandel. It's my two ringer YY. It, I just want to acknowledge the importance of place. We're talking about health here and the definition of health I subscribe to is the ability to negotiate the inevitable ups and downs of life. And I think the, the, the place of connection uh, in that, especially to the land and that place, and a place to do those activities, to be with family, friends, community, and be um, active, engaged in the outdoors is important. Um, to public health, though, my field, and I think you'll hear a lot about chronic disease and mental health, but to bring some statistics that bring that to life, this is how I like to talk about it, because it hits me the hardest and makes it real. The first thing to think about in New Zealand is that there's five million people. Therefore, in any one year, there are five million years of life to be lived. And one way of working out uh, how our health or lack of health or our health span suffers is to figure out the number of life years lost due to poor health. And you can discount them, and they work this out. So you might get only 0.3 of a life year lost for the year of depression, but bipolar might be more. And what they, they're a little bit arbitrary, but in, in any case, you end up with this point that a million years a year in our country is lost due to poor health. You're still living, but you're living suboptimally. You're not living your best life. And then you can divide that up further and go, okay, well, you know, stuff happens. You'll um, stupidly fall off a ladder, um, you know, walk into a door like I did this morning. Uh, <laughs> there's a longer story about that, actually, and it, it really relates to Paul Taylor's talk yesterday. If you came to that, you might have noticed one thing that he said. He says, if you have poor night's sleep, then you're cognitively impaired the next morning, um, which is interesting. But you are not aware that you're cognitively impaired. In, in other words, you have no idea that you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and you know, while some of you might like to have Paul Taylor swirling in your head through the middle of the night, that wasn't, <laughs> wasn't how I was enjoying that. And I was like, sure, I'm going to wake up in the morning and present, and I'll have no idea that I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I suppose that's the good thing, regardless of how it goes, I think I'll be awesome. So <laughs> <laughs> you, of course, will know better. Uh, but we, we lose about 10% of those life years, 100,000, due to, to accidents, to contagious disease. Um, the other 90% are, of course, the the horsemen that we've talked about across this meeting so far, diabetes, cancer, the neurological disorders, uh, stroke and vascular disease, uh, poor mental health. Um, and those are avoidable, reversible, um, and manageable uh, with lifestyle treatment. The thing is, when you look at what we spend in our public health budget of $28 billion a year, it's, it's less than 1% of that goes to preventing those in the first place. To bring it even more to life, uh, there's this. In New Zealand, we have a national health survey and we measure health robustly, and one of those things is mental health. And one way to think about it is to use the K10, psychological distress. You can go and look at that yourself. And we've been doing that since 2010, 2011. And at that point in time, our young people, our 16 to 24-year-olds, had about 5% had severe psychological distress at one time. And that's bad. You don't want that. And that's a proportion of our um, vulnerable young people. We're the adults in society. But what's astonishing to me, and what the rapidity of the change in just the last 10 years, so uh, it's shot up until the 2021 uh, version, where it's just under a quarter of our young people at any one time are suffering from severe psychological distress. Now, how this isn't on the front page of the paper and the mainstream media, and we're discussing this um, as a serious issue, with the adults in uh, a relatively or formerly wealthy country, uh, and we have the resources to do something about that, and it's a perverse, perverse outcome. We can do better, and the future of medicine aims to do better on both of these metrics. Uh, to finish that, these are Australian statistics. I think the way that you can put them, Professor Rutledge from the Aussies, is 
at least you can see the percent on SSRIs. And we talk a lot about men's mental health, open up and talk about it, but the reality is that women suffer twice the prevalence of poor mental health than uh, men. And you can look at SSRI prescription, and if you look at the older Australian women, it'll be the same in New Zealand. A quarter of them are on psychiatric medicines, SSRIs, for their depression. You know, in, in the golden years of your life uh, as an older woman, um, uh, that's how we're doing as a society, and I think that's perverse. AI is on brand, and I told you I was going to generate some, and I've got a bunch of images generated by AI today, uh, mid-journey, so you can guess which ones are which. This is obviously AI, and I'll tell you about some of the prompts. It's all about the questions, just like health coaching. It's the questions that you ask. Um, this one is, can you draw me an ambulance in a dystopian future at the bottom of the cliff? There you go. <laughs> I asked it to give me the future of medicine, and that was its first effort. <laughs> I don't think so. I got distracted and asked it to give me a dystopian view of a, a future view of Auckland. There it is, burning. <laughs> Let's not hope for that either. Uh, and this is a real clue about AI. This is um, a, a view of uh, Antoine Beauchamp and Louis Pasteur duking it out in, the, uh, in, in 19th century France. And you can tell it's AI because it's got a random arm on the right there. You see. <laughs> I think it's either Pasteur's got a really long arm or it's just randomly put it there. It doesn't do arms and hands um, very well, but we've, we've heard about Beauchamp and uh, his terrain theory and Pasteur and the germ theory. You know, the reality is that part of the problem was that while Beauchamp was on the right track, his mechanism was wrong. He thought there was a thing internal to cells called microzymes, which there weren't, of course, uh, and he really lost that fight. And it's arguable, and I suppose I do want to argue, that we've followed germ theory to its bitter end. And that's where we stand now at medicine, hopefully in the lowest ebb that it will feel, that we're at the bitter end of germ theory. And I think nothing could have been more obvious than that for COVID. When I first found out about COVID and I understood the metabolic risk factors uh, in terms of blood, sugar and glucose control, metabolic health, fitness, uh, vitamin D status, so I was actually encouraged that would finally be a turning point in public health worldwide about taking the actual determinants of our health seriously. Of course, we didn't do that. We turned our back on that altogether and followed uh, uh, germ theory to its bitter end. Some more AI about the future of medicine, better procedures, um, looking in a cool place, not so much. I asked it to make a nicer one. Uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> in the end, I had to ask it to make an old age superhero which I think what we've been after, right, that's medicine 3.0 is health span, that, that we live long and we drop dead, those things coincide, and an idiopathic death at the end of your life after an extensively healthy one is what we're after. So more AI. Um, I think if you're wearing Lycra, it should at least be tight. He's probably got a little bit of work to do, that fellow. Um, the other guy's looking pretty good. Um, this cutie, of course, doesn't exist at all in reality. Um, but it's a beautiful example of what we should be aiming for in terms of um, well-being. I've been writing a book. This is what academics get to do. I don't know if people are aware of how um, easy and good our job is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I've been thinking a lot about hormetic medicine. I don't think that um, AI did a very good job on both my first two book covers, so I have to get someone that actually knows what they're doing on um, to that. But it's about hormetic medicine and, and that mismatch between environment and reality. AI, again, that guy's not actually real, of course. Um, and, and we're aware of you know, the four main physical mismatches, and I won't talk so much about those now, but the movement mismatches, the fact that we're mostly sedentary and can be easily. The light mismatch, that the variations in the quality and quantity of light that we experience by being in an outdoor, unstable environment um, are crucial determinants of our health. The mismatch of ultra-processed food with the real food, you've heard so much about that. And the temperature mismatch that we're in a controlled environment. And none of those things enable the stress that confers health on us. There's some more mismatches, though, um, and I want to explore some of these a little bit more. I think I call these psychological mismatches, and they're interesting. The first is a social mismatch theory. It really came to be in 2019 with some some psychologists and an evolutionary biologist at the uh, 
University of Southern California, coming with this idea of weird environments, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, and you know, this didn't resemble anything that humans had ever lived in before. And, um, and then they came up with a new version of this called strangely weird. The mismatch is that we live in strangely weird environments. And the question is, what does the acronym strangely stand for? And it's an interesting idea. I'm not going to go through all of these, but the social environment that we live in with social media, you can move uh, easily from place to place. You can relocate. Um, some of these ideas that you can end up without um, even trying to have children has been not a thing that society's had. Um, that you could even choose your partner. And the research around that's an interesting thing. The idea that uh, we're in small groups where you don't actually know how to feed yourself or to run a society that's sustainable in of itself. The fact that there's even young people at all. Um, I mean, you used to move from puberty into adolescence to adulthood as a seamless and quick transition. Uh, this idea of your uh, youngster, and they're at my house, and they'll be at your house at some stage, or already have, or maybe hopefully they've left by now, but the idea that a youngster could be at your house until they're 30 years of age um, <laughs> is, in fact, strangely weird. <laughs> he's only 23, but he tells me he's not leaving until he's 30. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to concentrate a little bit more on this pleasure mismatch. And, and if you're in this field, you understand something about uh, dopamine, um, and this idea of homeostasis and, and down regulation of that neurotransmitter. I think we can best understand that. Um, perhaps we'll do it through vaping because that's become so prevalent, um, or mobile phones, or, or, or anything like that. But just think about this from, say, a cigarette smoking point of view. You take up smoking, uh, the nicotine in smoking provokes a, a super normal dopamine response. You feel good. Um, it's not so much about pleasure, about motivation, attentiveness, being ready to go. You feel, this is, this is, uh, this is, this is good. Um, the trouble is it's so high and much longer maintained than it normally would that, that the system wants to downregulate. So now, eventually, after a lot of smoking, your dopamine's way below baseline, so the opposite of that is actually some pain. Um, and all you're doing when you smoke is bringing it back to normal, normal homeostatic level. So it promises some pleasure and motivation, and it delivers the exact um, opposite. And of course, uh, something like you know, the things that we know in the modern world, vaping is now an access to a more continuous smoking, uh, gaming raises dopamine and, and down-regulates it in the same, same way, and so does social media and, and mobile phone use. And so now you've got an, a, a situation of ahedonia, so things that raise dopamine in a small way, patting your dog, kissing your wife. Now, that brings it right up. The <laughs> uh, eating just a normal, healthy food, diet, engaging in sports and exercise, learning. These never even return dopamine to baseline. In other words, they provide no evidence of pleasure or motivation. And it's very easy to see this. I've seen this with my own youngest son. If you give him unlimited access to gaming, then he ups his gaming, he becomes insulated, insular, um, emotional in, in unconstructive ways, um, and he no longer wants to engage in sport. He only eats food that is highly ultra-processed and can raise dopamine. Um, he's no longer interested in school. You restrict it, you go through the absolute fight that that is, uh, and it comes back to being a normal human being again. And I th think this is one of the most perverse mismatches in society that we're not talking about. Again, AI, um, obviously AI, but if you combine the current vaping epidemic in this country with social media use, uh, then you see something. And as a point of interest, um, these are US university students, medical students, but if you look at their social media use and their baseline dopamine, um, the more you use social media, the lower dopamine goes, and then you can actually intervene in this, which they did, um, restricted phone use to just two hours a day, which still seems like a fair bit, but in fact was more than halving it, and uh, you see a return to higher baseline levels, more productivity, higher well-being, less uh, pathology, 
um, in, in poor mental health systems, especially in anxiety and depression. So, you know, these are powerful things, these mismatches. And I think we were warned about this. Uh, and you might be surprised about the warning. So I think really in, in the turn of last century and then into the 1920s, there were two dystopian novels, one by George Orwell, who's 1984, of course, there was the idea of the thought police and burning books, Big Brother was going to surveil you. And, and that has turned true. You know, that's the Chinese Communist Party, I suppose, um, and, and other things. But, you know, not so much. Competing was, was Huxley's brave new world. He said, we're not going to need control because we'll be mired in our own pleasures. And um, let's just explore that. They never actually met, but you can do it by AI. Uh, LAUGHTER uh, although Huxley did write to Orwell in 1949, um, Orwell actually died at age 46 from tuberculosis and um, congratulated on, on the power of his dystopian novel. Huxley had, of course, already won the Nobel Prize in Literature at that time. Um, most instructive, and, I, and you might want to do this, this is, that this is just a thing that can happen, it's so cool. You can go back to the 1923 version of Vanity Fair, as you do, um, and you can examine... Huxley's 600-word essay, one single page in Vanity Fair called Pleasures. And I think, I think it's prophetic about the pleasure mismatch, the physical activity mismatch, and the place we're at. I'm just going to put up a couple of quotes here. Of all the various poisons which modern civilization, by a process of auto-intoxication, brews quietly up within its own bowels, few, it seems to me, are more deadly uh, while more, none appears more harmless than the curious and appalling thing that is technically known as pleasure. And he was, he was upset about the advent of movie theatres, for God's sake. <laughs> he didn't know about Netflix. <laughs> Countless audience soak in the passivity, passively in the tepid bath of nonsense. Oh my gosh, could anything be more true today? No mental effort is demanded of them, no participation. They need only sit and keep their eyes open. <laughs> At least you're laughing. <laughs> There's, of course, the stress mismatch, and I'm not going to spoil that too much today. We've talked about that uh, in other talks, that, that our autonomic nervous system is, is chronically activated for fight or flight rather than what it was designed for. That's obviously an issue. There's a fair mismatch. Yeah, you, should, you really want to learn that bad things could happen to you and you only want to experience once and never forget it because that would save your life in Paleolithic times. And if you did need to experience again, you were forced to, and so that would be extinguished, and that's single trial and, and behavioural conditioning. And there's more to trauma than that, but we can avoid them now, and we've talked about that, and I've heard speakers talk about that yesterday. There's the attention mismatch that when you move... You're not multitasking, there's no such thing. And the people who have the most insight and think they're the best multitaskers are the worst. Uh, you can physically multitask, you can push a broom and, and I don't know, flip an egg or something at the same time, that's possible, but, but you can't cognitively shift that load. In fact, doing that in the way the modern office environment is set up destroys performance and makes us deeply unhappy and, and causes pathology. Um, and, it, and some estimates are that you'd come, you, you, it takes you 20 odd minutes to come back to where you were on a task. And you want to try writing a book with interruptions, it's an impossible situation. You have to go away um, and not talk to people, um, which is quite good fun for a while. This prompt was the messy art and science of behavior change with the kid in the middle. So it's done that and it's a cool thing. But I want to just articulate this. I don't think we're talking about this, and we're not talking about this enough. I think the way I see these problems, we have two types of problems. One is a complicated problem. These are hard things. A complicated problem is building an airplane. If you've flown here, you'll marvel at the audacity and achievement of us as a species. No one person knows anything about how to build that from scratch let alone just the tray table. How do you do that from scratch? And there was a famous 1950s essay called I Pencil, which laments the idea that not even a single person could build a pencil from scratch, mine the graphite, grow the trees, mill them, put them together. 
Um, nevertheless, we can do those things reliably, and your plane will take off and it will land. Um, and if it's not Jetstar, it'll be on time. <laughs> <laughs> That's different from the human condition, which is a complex problem. And it's a little bit like you don't know what your dog's going to do next, or even what I'm going to say next, or what you might think in five minutes' time. These are not reliably predictable. And I think coaching and the idea of health coaching, the messy art and science of behavior change is that AI um, is going to be an important thing. I hear so much about algorithms and apps, and those will play an important part of it. But the human element in health, uh, to dance in the moment, to engage with someone, to ask them to reach emotional resonance about what and where they want to go, I think is, is unquestionably at the heart of the future of medicine. I've been trying to design this book into something that I appealed to me, so I called it Essential Elements of a Good Life, and I haven't finished it yet, so I'm not going to talk about all of those, but I wanted to pick up a few. Uh, and the first one is that hard stuff is medicine. And Paul Taylor talked about the problem of resilience, just getting back to where you were, and we don't even really have a word, and the economist Nassim Tlaib coined the word anti-fragile, that conferred with stress, this would be this hormetic response. And all biological systems um, in the right environments tend towards hormetic responses or anti-fragility. And you can see that same idea in physical training is a nice way to think about it. You, you um, haven't been running much, you go for a run, um, you turn up the next day because you're tired, you're worse than you were yesterday, even though you ran the day before, but allow some recovery and you can get this general adaptation or you could just read about it on the internet or get, download your program and you go too hard or um, you're trying to follow some elite person and you know, it all turns into overtraining. We get that part of it. Um, I, I just to, because um, Paul Taylor turned up yesterday and he was like, oh yeah, here we are with Sony, it's this 15 second cold shower and oh yeah, 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 oh so hard. Well the Schofield family, I'm here to tell you, they don't muck around with cold showers, they do chest freezes. <laughs> and, and, and even to show you that people who turn up a house, that's Professor Julia Rutledge came around for a drink, chucked her straight in the ice bath. <laughs> it was interesting, um, Dr. Glenn Davies, who you hear from that, he turned up um, with a tomato plant in, in um, the middle of March to give me, which is a bit late for the growing season, but uh, I wanted to repay him by offering a gun the ice bath. He said that he would sooner um, be unwell than jump in the ice bath. <laughs> uh, but that's Sam, my 22-year-old. Um, that's Danny, my 13-year-old. Uh, and I think we go for a dose of, of around three or, or four minutes in there, accompanied by box breathing. Um, these kids, for some reason, have taken this on board uh, by doing it every day. Um, we got up this morning because we wanted to feel a bit sharper and I was haunted by Paul Taylor. And, and so we ice bathed, banged the cortisol up, uh, you know, feeling great. I really like the idea of doing it in the, in the morning. Uh, I find that's really useful. I think you can, the sort of dose that we're expecting uh, in coldish water, 10 to 14 degrees, you can probably do 10 minutes in there, that's good, get cold. Uh, one of these ice baths is going to be closer to... Uh, only a few minutes that you could deal with, and it is fairly stressful. I mean, no one looks at this and goes, this will be fun. <laughs> Maybe one of you do. I don't know. Uh, but but the, the, it's really instructive about the hormetic benefit of the, the stress and the response, whether it be brown fat, whether it be learning the ability to um, deal with anxiety. And I think this is why clinical trials show these so powerful and, and anxiety. Uh, I've also got the sauna, and I'm a real fan of this. And I think, um, if anything, I, we've, it's hard to do randomized trials with these types of um, long-term chronic exposures, but the Finnish sauna studies are really instructive. Uh, the 10 years increase in, in life and quality of life is instructive. You know, these are huge effects. Um, the halving in every single metabolic and psychological condition in those cohorts compared to their controls is instructive, um, and that's allowing 
for matching as well. I think they also have uh, adjunctive benefits. You exercise, then you sauna. Um, you get an adjunctive benefits to the exercise plus the, the benefits of, of those things. And those are you know, really interesting studies as this field unfolds. Yeah, they cost a bit, and it turns out you have to rewire your whole house, who knew? Um, but, but there's profound uh, metabolic benefits across the board. If, you, if you're thinking of investing in your longevity, then um, there's a number of ways of thinking about that. Fitness is medicine, of course, and I think you know that, but I just want to reiterate the power of the effect. And I also want to investigate the um, not AI. It's astonishingly, not AI. <laughs> <laughs> which really bamboozled the rest of our family. Um, uh, and how do we give advice around fitness and around medicine in general? And we think about minimum effective dose is where we tend to place the public health things, do 30 minutes of something a day, and you know, gentle gardening will do, that's great, you're moving. And indeed, that has a use, and 50% of our population doesn't meet those guidelines, so maybe we do aim at, the, at getting people off the couch, yet those benefits keep occurring across fitness level, and we have optimal advice. And, and how do we struggle in public health and medicine in general to understand what optimal versus minimum effective advice. How do we meet people where they're able to move them along that journey? This is a friend of mine, Stephen, who's 63 years of age. Um, I don't say you have to be like Stephen. In fact, from some of the psychological characteristics, you wouldn't want to be, but that's a, a, another thing. Um, you can age well, and you start to look at some of the... This is a perspective study of two groups of 500 uh, 50-year-olds in California in the early 80s, and they were matched for demographics and health at that point, and they, they followed them for the next 22 years. And one group was active, but most of them met the minimum guidelines, and the other group was highly active. They were actually part of a San Diego running club, and they were doing about six hours of moderate to vigorous activity a week, sometimes more. And you, these are survival curves. I think you get the idea of a survival curve. At the start, everyone's alive, and at some point in the future, no one's alive. That's, you know, you're going to die, you know that? Uh, and it's, it's, it's how that, that survival curve goes. I think ideally it's high and then it drops off at the last minute. That's living long and dropping dead. And you can see a profound difference in these survival curves. The, the runners uh, have less than, more than half the death rate. Um, but, you know, you die, that's bad. It's not awesome an outcome, but you won't know. The, the reality is the quality of life is profoundly different. So in that highly active group, in that 22 years, there was a, 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 a 12 years per person of disability-free life years conferred. If there was a drug this powerful, um, this would be the best drug ever marketed. Um, yet we fail to even consider that in our in our guidelines about fitness, and, and, um, and, and measuring fitness even more carefully. These are these measures of cardiorespiratory fitness, so these are big cohorts, uh, you know, 100 and something thousand, um, following for a long time, two endpoints. Um, these would be death. Um, and you see things like this, okay, so they had the top 10% of fittest people versus the lowest 10%. You've got a five times more chance of surviving or a five times more chance of an early death if you're in those more extreme fitness categories. And you can see as you move up, that's all those things below that yellow line are the changes in fitness categories and their comparisons to each other. There's a dose response for every increase in your cardiovascular fitness. Um, you live longer um, and more healthily. And just by way of comparison, they have other data here. So you have something like end-stage renal disease. It's not called end-stage renal disease for nothing. Um, your chances of early death are 2.8 times. And you look at something like cigarette smoking, diabetes 1.4 times. Uh, fitness is medicine, and it's a powerful medicine. Um, and, and what disturbs me, and, and there may be something disturbing about this, I admit it, I dress up in tight lycra, and I walk out the door at the university, and someone yells at me, oh, yeah, you fitness freak. And it's like, I, 
I'm trying to live my best life. Um, and then you think of a few other things you say. Of course, you don't say them because it's inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> well, or sometimes you do, even. Uh, <laughs> and so we know that we lose fitness as we age, um, even when we work hard at it. And so the question is, should we take youth physical activity and aerobic capacity seriously because it declines even when we try? Here's elite level people declining through age, even with training. Here's the middle 50th percentile, and here's the bottom 20th, 5th percentile. And you know, the problem is when you get to a very low VO2 when you're older, um, then you're physically incapable of the, with the capacity to do things, um, you know, walking up gentle slopes, carrying your groceries, living your best life, putting and carrying suitcases a distance, uh, these types of things. If you've got a VO2 of 14 or lower, um, then you've only got a 50% chance of surviving anesthesia because of your lack of physical capacity to deal with the insult of that surgery. And so we, we could take this so much more importantly and, and aggressively. Um, and the same goes for strength. You, you know, build it up when you're young. Um, there's the top quartile. There's the middle 50%. There's the lowest 25%. Uh, you're going to lose some strength as you age. That's inevitable. But if you maintain it, you never fall into that low physical function, and you certainly don't fall into disability, where you do otherwise, and giving minimum effective dose advice just doesn't allow that to happen. And I think we can do so much better. I'm a real fan of, of, of the following three tests, and no one seems to want to talk about them. I put them out on my research center, and, and, and we study this stuff, and they will laugh at me, but I say, see how far you can get in 12 minutes, that'll measure your VO2. Um, see how long you can hang off a bar, dead hang, um, and see how many push-ups or modified push-ups you can do in a row, and there's age by sex norms for that, and you figure out where you are for your age, um, or where you want to be. It's not the be all and end all, but they're good functional tests um, for some of the most important uh, characteristics of, of our well-being. Uh, I just took some photos around the house, um, pinched that off a building site. Um, Oh, that's my coaching. I coach athletes, and I just don't think that is where fitness is medicine. You learn so much more from uh, these athletes around well-being and psychology and everything, but racing Ironmans, not good for you. I'm just putting it out there, and I train people. I've just been at events. It's all good fun, but don't think that's a health thing. Um, just to prove you can't have too many bikes. Uh, <laughs> And this is our main piece of fitness equipment. This is Bluey. He's a 12 and a half year old border collie. And uh, the reality of having to um, do your duty to walk with them. It's an interesting thing, because we know if we don't walk Bluey, his well-being plummets. And so we'll walk Bluey for his well-being, which perversely, uh, well, well, happily, affects our well-being. Um, I've actually published on this, and I did it about 20 years ago. It really does depend on the size of your dog. So the main benefits around uh, mortality, uh, risk, met poor mental health, depended on, they only kicked in when you've got a medium-sized dog or bigger. So there, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Surfing in the style of Pablo Picasso, I reckon you could put that on your wall. <laughs> um, food is medicine, of course. Uh, we know that, and I just want to examine that idea of minimum effective dose and the sort of advice we give and how we work on that. Uh, Glenn Davies calls it the nutrition ladder. Uh, you know, we've clearly got an ultra-processed food epidemic. These are data from a study we've been doing in New Zealand primary schools where we just get the kids to put their lunch. It's a single kid in each box for the day. You know, there's, a, there's four examples. And I put those up to be like bad examples. I put them up as typical ones. Uh, Fern, my master's student, was doing the study, went into the toilets and cried at, at the thing. You know, this is a disturbing thing. Uh, and, you know, how we change that. So, you know, we, in this, these schools, 80% of what was coming to school was ultra-processed food. The school tried to change this by in, uh, putting in a, a, a no-packets policy, and all that happened is that they'd take the ultra-processed food out of the packet and put it in a container. So, uh, and also we noticed that it's interesting because... I thought there would be big social demographic differences here. And there are in the foods, but they're all ultra-processed. Some just have more health claims on the front. You know, contains fruit, uh, you know, veggie crisps. They were still ultra-processed foods. They just looked slightly healthier. 
AI. I think that's cheese coming from his nose. <laughs> <laughs> So we can give advice around ultra-processed food, and I think that's where we should start, but how do we give more optimal advice around the regulation of blood sugar and controlling that? And I think the way we go in the complicated side of this problem with devices in the future will be so, so important, uh, and we can do better there. I've been writing about that for one, two, three, four, five, six, um, and I wrote, yeah, so I've written seven books, Kevin. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what do we need to know about fasting and, and not uh, remain massive unanswered questions and the role of talking about catabolism and anabolism and measuring that. These are places we still need to go in the field. The mitochondria, that was a cell you saw in, the, in, uh, in uh, secondary school. Of course, it's um, complete rubbish because there's only a couple of mitochondria there. In fact, there's some ridiculous number the sheer magnitude of energy generation at a cellular level and how food and exercise and whatnot affect that is um, just simplistic and astonishing. You know, three times 10 to the power of 24 um, Krebs cycles ATP generated in a human body. So that's a septillion. If you've never heard of that, I looked it up. Uh, who knows what that even means? Uh, the numbers are mind-boggling. I just want to finish with light as medicine. I used to call this sleep as medicine, but I think that the... the full understanding of exactly how something that has zero mass and zero charge yet contains energy and can travel billions of kilometres and confer that is just an astonishing thing. And of course, it has an effect on every cell in our body. And Matthew Phillips often talks about, well, yeah, it's all very good talking about cells, but in fact, you know, it's cells are just bags to hold the mitochondria. Well, the mitochondria just bags to hold the atoms, Matt. The, 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 the field of quantum biology, um, which if you know something about, you don't understand it, I think is the way to describe that. Uh, and the ideas of quantum coherence, quantum superposition, uh, quantum entanglement, the spooky action at a distance, as Einstein described it, quantum uh, tunneling, astonishing things, which are now well demonstrated at cellular level and atomic level in humans, but nothing uh, more obvious than the way light confers energy and changes uh, positions of atoms, even in, in electrons, even in the mitochondria, and you know, nothing is more obvious than how it does that through the uh, blue, higher blue wavelength in the middle of the day and this red wavelength that are coming out at the end of the day. But there's a really interesting idea that the red wavelength light and then the infrared and near infrared and even the far infrared um, hits the mitochondria in the retinal cells um, and moves ADP to ATP. It's conferring direct energy into the electron transport chain. chain. Um, an astonishing thing that's doing the same through vitamin uh, D synthesis, it's doing the same through nitric oxide uh, release, it's doing the same through T cell lymphoma um, activation and release in the sun and our mismatch between the light that we get and the light that we need in a biologically appropriate for is a profoundly misunderstood and understudied thing. And you can look at some of these things. So these are different light bulbs. And look at this one. This is cool white LED screens. Can you think of anything that has that? Hello? Um, yeah. I, 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 I'm getting the word. Oh. Um, and, and saunas, infrared saunas particularly, can play a role in this. Um, this is what they're not conferring so much as the hormesis of heat, although there is some of that um, as the hormesis of light um, and infrared and far infrared and, and red light are amazing things. Breathing is medicine. We've talked about that. If you haven't done this, one of the advantages of going to Precure Labs is some student will tell you to tape your mouth up. And, and I did that. I don't know if people do this. You just put this on your mouth, go to sleep. Incredibly sexy. Um, and um, you stop snoring and resolves, you have a great night's sleep and you secrete vasopressin and you go to the toilet less for a 50-year-old male is awesome. And, and away you go from there. We put it on our 13-year-old and, uh, and his allergies that we could only treat with uh, immune suppressants um, ceased. He was sneezing 50 times a day and that stopped. An astonishing thing. Need to explore that more.
Uh, we're just going to finish with one minute of philosophy. Uh, and I just wanted to tell you about this. So I don't know if anyone's particularly interested, but because I was writing a book and I'm an academic, I thought, well, I'll review all of the literature on well-being ever published. So I started back in Stoicism and the Bible and Buddhism and Tao Te Ching and these sorts of things. Then I moved into modern self-help and, and the modern scientific literature. And I thought, well, if there's, there must be universal coherence here if things are true about well-being. And so I came up with this idea of the four essential truths. And this is what I came up with. Um, make what you can of it. It might be rubbish as far as you're concerned. Truth number one, you're going to die. And I mean that in a very positive way, and not just in the logical thing of that, but the visceral understanding of that, and why the Buddhists would do death meditations to understand the very rotting of their flesh. As perverse as that sounds, understanding the finality and the shortness of what we have will make you inspired to be the best you can be from the time you have. And I think that is universal across these things. Um, less is more. Getting more stuff will not make your life better once you can uh, feed yourself and achieve most of those things. Um, your life will change. And so the peak of your academic ninjurus, your, your cognitive ability is in your mid-30s and like muscle mass and VO2, it will decrease. Is that all bad news? No, because wisdom, a second protest you can accumulate and if you can switch into using your wisdom as you age, you will have a better life. Failure to do so, to realise that you don't have to be an accumulator, you can be a teacher, uh, a mentor, a changer, um, means that your life can change in positive ways. And lastly, uh, loss, pain and failure are not just inevitable, they are necessary. I think growth is hormetic uh, and stress confers a better human um, under the right conditions. Let's just right, find the right conditions. Uh, Huxley also said um, that we do not learn very much from the lesson of history as the most important lessons of all history. So the future of medicine is one where we must learn and prevention is cure. Thank you very much.